Okay, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Welcome for this uh, new seminar at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía here in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Jax uh, Kluska. And uh, he will talk about circumbinary, circumbinary disk around post IGB stars. Do they form second generation planets? Jax did his PhD in 2014 at the uh, IPAG Institute in Grenoble in France on infrared interferometric imaging of protoplanetary disk around young stars. He then moved to the uh, University of Exeter in UK to study these disks using a multi-instrumental approach at high angular resolution. Finally, in 2017, he moved to Belgium to uh, KU Leuven to work on disks around evolved binaries that are very similar to disks around young stars. In 2020, he obtained a grant from the Flemish Research Council to observationally characterize these disks and investigate if planet formation is possible in such an exotic environment. So thank you very much, Jax, for accepting this invitation, for giving us this talk. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for this nice uh, introduction, Rene, and uh, good, good morning to everyone. So I'll just maybe remove this. And uh, so, yeah, I'm very happy uh, to be here. Thank you for having me here. And I'm very excited to give this talk about uh, disk and plant formation around post main sequence stars. And as I said, I started uh, my research on uh, young, uh, on protoplanetary disk on young stars and studying them observationally to, to study the initial conditions for plant formation. And in the recent years, I discovered that actually some evolved binaries host also very similar disks of dust and gas. And so I'm studying them observationally to, to compare them to the disk around young stars and to see where those disks are forming plants uh, uh, or not. Uh, and so of course, I'm looking for exchanges and ideas about this topic as it's relatively uh, a, a new way to, to study plant formation in such exotic uh, environments. So of course here, all my uh, collaborators uh, with whom I'm working towards understanding uh, those uh, disks. So let's start, if it works. OK, here we go. Now it should work. OK, all right. So planets, so now we know more than 5,000 uh, exoplanets and most of them, uh, the very vast majority, uh, uh, in fact, is formed around the stars when they were young. And uh, actually, when they are forming protoplanetary disks that are disks of dust and gas that we find around young stars and to understand all the diversity of the population of detected exoplanets, we can uh, study protoplanetary disks in order to have the initial conditions, so the physical conditions in which those planets uh, formed, but also to look for signs of ongoing planet formation. And so in the recent years, with the advent of uh, observatories like ALMA, but also very large telescope, we thought to have uh, specially resolved images of those disks. And they really revolutionized the field because we see a lot of substructures in those disks. So we see, for example, the ALMA in the radio, we see the gaps and the rings in one of those disks with uh, indirect imaging in the infrared, uh, in polarimetric imaging, actually, we can see some spiral structures and more chaotic structures in those disks. We can see also disks that have very large uh, cavities that are probably due to, to a companion. And we also start to see asymmetries at the very inner regions of protoplanetary disks has roughly one astronomical unit from uh, the star. So we have all the tools now to really image the disk and use this information to constrain our uh, planet uh, formation theories. And there are several questions that are now uh, really um, uh, really hot in the community is that how fast those plant forms and also to know whereas those substructures are related to plant formation, will they form uh, planets or are they due to already form protoplanets in those disks that perturb the disk and make this uh, asymmetries. Uh, 
But today, I'm not going to uh, talk about disks uh, around young stars, but more about disks around uh, evolved stars. And can you form planets around uh, evolved stars? Actually, some of the planets uh, uh, can be detected around uh, evolved uh, binaries. So here there's one example, the NNSER system, that is a binary, an ecliptic binary for white dwarf and M dwarf. And you can, uh, people started to follow up uh, the eclipses of this uh, binary and they start to find out that there is a very small delay between uh, at each eclipse of just a few seconds. So here you have the cycles, so the number of, of orbits, so basically time in the x-axis and the y-axis, you have the delay from eclipse to eclipse. And you see that the time scale is just a few seconds, but the eclipses are not very regular. And so to, uh, try to uh, explain that uh, people have fitted a model with uh, a planet, and actually two planets, that will uh, perturb the inner binary just by uh, just gravitationally, and uh, because of that, because of the light travel time uh, effect, it will generate such a such a shift. And so they fitted the the data up to uh, two far, end of 2010, and they extrapolate uh, this model to uh, other orbits, and they follow up followed up, sorry, this uh, target. And they saw that actually the observations are really following the prediction from this planetary model. So these planets are very, I think the most robust to be detected around such a system. And so people started to find out whether uh, this, uh, those planets are uh, dynamically stable and if they could have survived the giant phase of what is now a white dwarf. And they found out that they they could not have um, survived this giant phase because the orbit would have been uh, unstable. And so those planets are very good, actually the best candidates to be formed as a second generation. So in the disk around around this uh, double uh, this uh, binary, but when the white dwarf was a was a giant star. And so the best model is uh, with two planets with uh, two and seven Jupiter masses at three and five AU roughly. And a few years later, they started to look for dust. So, so from debris from the disk that could have formed this planet and they detected some dust with, uh, with Alma in this uh, system. So that's very pro promising. And, um, and uh, we wanted to know if we observe actually such disks that could uh, form those planets. And of course the answer is yes, because it's actually the topic of my talk. So we see the best candidates for second generation uh, protoplanetary disk around post-HB binaries. So what, I post, what are post-HB stars? So here you have a HR diagram. So you have the temperature increasing to the left and the luminosity increasing to the, um, to the top. And you see you have a, um, an evolutionary track for one solar mass single star. And you see that the post-HB phase is between the giant branches and the white dwarf phase. So it's a transition phase uh, where the star has really the highest luminosity of uh, its uh, um, whole uh, evolution. And uh, however, this is for a single star, as I said, but if you put a, a companion that is close enough, it will perturb the primary when it's uh, a giant. And so it, you can have uh, interaction, binary interaction. So it could be just tidal interaction or rush lobe overflow, but it can also be a common envelope um, uh, evolution. And so it will interrupt the giant uh, track because the envelope will be uh, lost earlier than uh, around just if the star was single and we start this post HB phase earlier. And so the, the core of the star will contract and become a white dwarf um, uh, a bit earlier. But what we also know is that uh, when you have a companion, this binary interaction, whatever it is, it's not very well constrained, will form a circumbinary disk. And so we know about 85 of those post HGB binaries in our galaxy, and there are uh, around 200 uh, also um, uh, post HGB binaries in the LMC and SMC. So the problem here is to know very well the distance to those targets. Are there binaries? Uh, the distance may be uh, biased, and then the luminosity as well. And so it's difficult to to uh, um, to assess if if such a system is supposed to be binary or not. Okay, so I told you that when you have a binary, you form a disk, but how do we know that? Well, uh, people started to look at the photometry, the spectral energy distributions of all the post-HGB 
targets, so the single stars, binary stars, and they found something like that. So here you have the flux in the y-axis, the wavelength in micron in the x-axis, and in the visible, you can fit uh, the uh, SED of a photosphere in black. And you see that in red, in the infrared, you have uh, an excess for those uh, targets. And you have two types of excess. You have a shell-like excess where you can actually fit just a black body at a single temperature. And so actually the infrared excess is coming from the dust. So if you put your dust grains at a given uh, distance from the star, like in the shell, you will obtain just a single temperature um, uh, black body uh, emission. But if you have a disk, so you put your dust grains at different radii from the star, you have several black bodies that will add up and it will form this kind of smooth infrared excess, very similar to what we see around young stars. And when people started to uh, monitor those targets with radial velocity to look for binarity, oops, this way, they found that the shell-like excesses are always single. We never find a, sec uh, a secondary, a second body in those systems, but we almost always find a secondary in the systems where they, they show a disk-like excess. So it's a very strong empirical and observational link actually between binarity and the presence of the circumbinary disk. Okay. Another feature that uh, I wanted to mention about uh, those targets, and I will come back to it at the, uh, uh, later in the talk, is the chemical composition of the post-AGB star. So the post-AGB star is now, is now almost a wide dwarf. It starts to, to contract. And so we can look at all the elements that are on the surface of the star. And so here we have the abundance of each element. And on the x-axis, you have the condensation temperature of this element. And you see that there is a depletion for elements with higher condensation temperatures. So basically there is a depletion for refractory elements compared to volatiles that stay uh, constant. And that's very interesting because it was interpreted as the fact that you have reaccretion of, uh, um, of the matter from the disk onto the post-AGB star, but somehow the dust is trapped in the disk and only the depleted uh, matter, so the, the, only the volatiles are accreted onto the post-AGB. And this is what we see uh, when we observe this kind of um, uh, refractory uh, depletion on the surface of the star. Um, okay, and for example, uh, here iron is not tracing the metallicity of the target, but it's rather tracing this depletion of refractory elements because the metallicity is actually uh, uh, washed out by this uh, phenomenon that um, dominates uh, the what we see observationally. Okay, so here are some of the properties of the system that are summarized uh, relatively quickly. So the disk formation process is the binary interaction, so this ejection of the stellar atmosphere and some of this ejection is bound to the system in the orbital plane of the binary, so we systematically have a binary at the center. The central star is a post-AGB star, so it's high luminosity, it's at the top of the HR diagram. Uh, we have some signs of accretion and outflow. So for example, the chemical depletion is an indirect sign of, um, of accretion, but we also see jets, jets sorry, from the secondary and outflows from the disk. And those targets are, uh, are uh, isolated because they are evolved, they're not in a star forming region. And that's actually quite interesting for, for testing some plant formation uh, processes. And so the disk properties themselves, so we have this infrared excess that is disk-like, they are stable as seen uh, from the CO uh, observations in the radio with allman patudbure interferometer. So here I have an example of, of such, a, um, uh, such an observation where you can fit a, a Keplerian uh, disk. The disk mass is around 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 2 uh, solar masses. Actually, in dust, some of them has 10 to minus 3 solar masses, so they are quite massive and very comparable to what we see around young stars. We have some evidence for dust growth uh, for some of the targets. And um, but the disk uh, lifetime is believed to be quite short because the uh, this post-AGB transition phase is expected to be relatively short. And when the wild world becomes very, very hot, it starts to photo evaporate um, uh, the disk. All right, so why do we care about those systems? So traditionally, we the uh, the systems were studied because of stellar evolution and more specifically because of binary evolution. Why? Because we are just after 
a binary interaction phase. And so we have, we can directly observe the products of this binary interaction, which is very difficult during the AGB phase because you have all the dust around and you have convection on the stars. So if you want to uh, detect a, a secondary, it's very difficult for, from radial uh, velocity, whereas for post-AGB stars, it's, um, it's way uh, easier. And so, for example, uh, you can study the product and see what is the, um, the distribution of periods that you can expect from binary interactions. So, for example, if the two stars go through a common envelope evolution, you expect the orbit to shrink because the secondary spiral in and you expect it to be circular. But if they are more separated and they just do go through wind interaction because of the mass loss, the orbit will widen. So we expect to have this this bimodal distribution of the periods. And so um, from the results from the radial velocity survey, what we find is this. So we see that the distribution of periods is really between the two peaks where, where we do not expect to have actually the, the binary orbit. So there's something that we do not understand from this binary interaction. And that's why those targets were interesting. Um, interesting, sorry, to, uh, to study. There also are progenitors of planetary nebula, so those beautiful images that I'm sure you know. And if you have a bipolar planetary nebula, it's also expected that it could be due to a binary uh, at, the, at the center. Okay, but today I will not talk about this, actually. I will talk more about disk physics and planet formation. So I will focus more on the disk itself because it's, a, it's really a new laboratory to study disk physics and uh, planet formation physics in a very peculiar parameter space. And so we can test different theories. We can test the time scales, the high, the, what happens when the central star is very luminous and what happens when the presence of, of planets that are already there before the disk the second generation disk forms. And so we can see if the dust grain can grow very fast or not because they have to grow before the disk uh, dissipates. We can look for substructures in the disk and ultimately we can also look for uh, plant formation efficiency of those, uh, of those disks. But before going to that, we need to answer some very interesting questions about the disk processes. And so maybe to go more into, into detail, I can uh, just detail a bit more um, some of the things that we can test in this disk. So for example, the time scales. Um, so from the study of, uh, of disk around young stars, we start uh, to, uh, to see that, the, for example, the masses of class two disks. So class two disks are all the disks that are older than one million year. They are not massive enough to produce the observed population of, uh, of exoplanetary systems. And we find N of mass only in very young uh, protoplanetary disks that are just a fraction of, uh, of a million year old. So plant formation uh, might happen very, very quickly. We also start to observe substructures in disks like rings and, uh, and gaps in very young uh, objects. And by studying post-AGB disk, we know that everything that we find in this disk, the substructures for grain growth must have happened in a fraction of a million years. So we will actually uh, test if, uh, if the formation of substructures or uh, grain growth is uh, quick enough to form planets uh, so quickly. Also, the, uh, late, uh, in the last few years, we have we start to see that there is um, an interaction between protoplanetary disks around young stars and their star forming environment, when you can have some episodic reaction of matter from the environment onto the protoplanetary disk, and that will uh, that can perturb the disk and also um, trigger a new episode of plant formation. So that's very interesting, but this is something that uh, will not happen in post stage binary systems because they are isolated. So everything that we see there, every structures that we see there, we cannot invoke this reaccretion of, of matter onto the, onto the disk. And the last thing that I wanted to highlight is, um, is the influence of planets on plant formation. So there is a chicken and egg problem in plant formation theories is that uh, where if you already have a giant plant in the disk, it will perturb the disk, will make some um, locations where there's a high uh, gas pressure and where, where the dust grain, dust grain, grain sorry, can grow very efficiently. And so you can uh, make planets more easily if you already have a planet in the disk. And actually, this is something that can happen in the second generation disks because the first generation planets could have survived the giant phase, can still be there from the start when the disk forms, perturb the disk and actually 
maybe enhance um, the plant formation efficiency, or uh, at least the dust grain growth in those substructures. Um, okay, so those are the, just few things that I wanted to highlight, but uh, of course there are many uh, other ideas that we can test there. And so, as I told you at the beginning of my talk, I want to uh, investigate that um, uh, observationally. And so in order to do that, uh, I want to have images of those disks and to do, to have images, we need to specially resolve uh, the targets uh, and we need to know what are the scales that we are talking about for those uh, targets. So this is uh, just a schematic, uh, an artistic uh, picture of such a system. When you see the inner binary here, have the post AGB here, you have the main sequence star here with an accretion disk, some bipolar outflow, and you have circumbinary disk with some uh, spiral structures. And there's even the planet there, of course, it's an artistic impression, but uh, and the separation between the two stars is roughly one astronomical unit. The inner uh, disk radius in dust is 10 astronomical units because of the high luminosity of the star, the dust sublimates uh, relatively far from the central binary. And the outer disk cream in dust is around 100 astronomical units, it's just to have an idea of the scales. And so the typical distance to those targets is one kiloparsec. So that's very handy because at those uh, distances, one astronomical unit is a thousandth of an arc second or one milliard second. So if you're able to have a one milliard second resolution, you can resolve one astronomical unit in these systems. And we are quite lucky because we have actually all the instrumentation to do that, to have the images of those, of those targets. For example, for the inner parts of the disk and the inner binary, we can use knee infrared interferometry at the VLTI with instruments like Pioneer and Gravity. We can probe uh, the inner regions and you see that, that uh, this wavelengths uh, at uh, two microns, we can probe the very start of the infrared axis. In the mid infrared, we can still use VLTI with the MITIS instrument where we probe the inner disk region uh, up to 10, 20 astronomical uh, units. And with ALMA, we probe the outer parts uh, of, the, of the disk in the mid plane and also probing uh, larger uh, grain sizes that in the infrared. And we can also add scatter light observations with uh, instruments like Sphere, for example, where we probe the disk surface or so the small grades or the disk surface that are scattering stellar light. Um, and so we can really probe the 3D structures of those disks and study them for um, uh, to, and characterize them in detail. So in the first part of my, of my talk, I will mostly focus on the VLTI observations of those disks. And the second part, I will uh, rather focus on ALMA and Sphere uh, ongoing observations. All right, so after this uh, quite long introduction, now I can um, start to show you some results that we got. So I will start with um, an image on one uh, such a system. Then I will go to the surveys to see if this system is representative of all the all those space TGP targets. I will talk about the very uh, recent exciting uh, discovery of transition disks around those targets. So transition disk is disks with very large inner cavity. And then I will go towards observational uh, perspectives. All right, so let's uh, start with uh, uh, one target RS weight. Okay, so RSO8 544 minus 4431, I will just say RSO8 in the rest of the talk, is uh, a binary. So here you have the radial uh, velocity with time with a model that is fitted and so you have a period of uh, around 500 days, a moderate eccentricity of 0.2. And you have the spectral energy distribution with a wavelength. Uh, that is really disk-like, uh, that shows a nice uh, disk-like infrared access. And so we gathered a lot of observations with the VLTI in the near infrared in order to characterize um, the uh, very inner uh, structures. And if we um, apply conventional image reconstruction, this is what we get. We just get a very one very um, bright blob at the center. And this is the primary star that emits around uh, 50 to 60% of the light in the infrared. And then we can use a special technique called Sparkle where we subtract the central star and then we can reveal the, uh, its environment. And so that's very nice because we can see two things. The first one is the point source very close to the post AGB uh, star. And it's uh, at the location of the secondary. And this is unexpected because the secondary is a main sequence star. And so the luminosity of the main sequence star compared to the post-AGB star that is uh, uh, 10,000 uh, solar luminosity 
is, I mean, the contrast is so huge that we are not expected to, to see that. We think that we see the accretion disk instead around the secondary, uh, that is roughly a one astral unit from the primary. And we also see this very nice ring, which is the dust sublimation front of the circumbinary disk. We can also remove the secondary with sparkle, and uh, we see that the inner rim is at a radius of uh, eight astronomical uh, units. And it's also uh, not uh, axisymmetric. So we see that there is one maximum on this side, which is kind of expected because it's the side where the post AGB star is closer, uh, closest to the, to the disk. So because of the illumination, you have one side that is uh, brighter than the other, but you have also other maximum on the other side that could be due to disk binary interactions or a spiral wave, for example, going to the inner rim. We also have the temperature, which is roughly consistent with the dust sublimation um, at this um, uh, for this target. Okay, so this is just the image, but then we use the radiative transfer uh, model to model the visibilities in the infrared, but also the spectral energy distribution. And we used MCMAX, which is the radiative transfer code that is usually used to uh, reproduce or to model protoplanetary disk around young stars. And it reproduces very well, as you can see, the spectral energy dis uh, distribution, but also the uh, visibilities from uh, Pioneer. And so this is um, uh, the model um, in the uh, surface uh, density with uh, radius. So you see that you have the dust sublimation at, at a astronomical unit, the binary is here. It increases, the um, surface density increases up to a certain radius, and then it decreases um, as in, um, as expected in protoplanetary disk. And the dust mass is around 10 to the minus three uh, solar masses uh, for this uh, uh, model. Of course, it's a, um, it's a very crude assumption because we only have near infrared spatial resolving information and the SED, but it's roughly in the right uh, ballpark. So they are quite massive, those disks. And we follow up uh, this, uh, um, this disk with uh, all the instruments uh, that we have in the, at the VLTI, so we have the, here the visibilities uh, with Pioneer at 1.5 micron, here with gravity at two microns, uh, in Elbent at three micron with Matisse, and also at 10 micron also with Matisse. You have the visibilities in blue, so data in blue, and orange you have the uh, fit of the geometrical model, and so it roughly reproduces quite well the, the data. And here this is the image from the geometrical model fit. Okay, so you can see that for the near infrared wavelengths, a Gaussian with a single temperature reproduces the data uh, quite well, but at uh, longer wavelengths, you need a model with uh, um, a gradient in temperature uh, and uh, in radius to uh, reproduce the data. And so this is the work of uh, the, the PhD student at K11, like a corporal. And uh, she um, interpreted these observations as evidence for a disk that is not flat, but is more rounded, puffed up at the inner rim. And so the, the su emission surface at the inner rim is very large. So that's why we are dominated by one single temperature in the near infrared. And then in the mid infrared, we start to probe the rest of the disk. And that's why the models with the uh, gradient in temperature for in radius are reproducing the data better. And now she's working into having a full radiative transfer model uh, to reproduce all the data at once. So starting with the model that we had from the infrared, but then um, trying to reproduce all the, all the wavelengths, which is actually quite complicated, but she's, she's, uh, she's having nice results. So stay tuned to, uh, to know more. Okay, so this is the results on one target and wanted to know if this target is actually very representative of the whole population of post AGB binaries. So we started to make surveys with the VLTI in the infrared. And here is a survey that we made with uh, Pioneer. So at 1.65 micron, uh, we had 23 targets. And so we probed the disk in a rim and in a binary. And here are the images from geometrical models. So we cannot do image reconstruction because it was a snapshot observations. We don't have enough UV coverage to have an image. Uh, but these this are the images from the fit of the geometrical uh, models. And here are the main conclusions that we had from the survey. The first one is that the inner uh, rim of the circumbinary disk is ruled by dust uh, sublimation. And so um, we determined that by um, putting the size of the, of the ring that we fitted to the data. 
against the luminosity of the central of the post HB star. And if you have the sublimation radius at a given temperature, let's say 1500K or, or 1000, uh, 1000 uh, Kelvin, you expect that the size is uh, scales with the square root of the luminosity of the central star. And this is what we obtained. So in purple here, you have the post HB binaries. And in uh, blue green, you have the uh, young star objects. And you see that they are following the same trend. However, it seems that there is a small shift that could be due to a different mineralogy of the dust. In uh, this disk, for example, here, the dust grains can, can sublimate at lower temperature and so have um, a larger radius, but also it depends on the local density at the, at the dust sublimation uh, region. Um, yeah, and the truncation a radius from the inner binary is always smaller, uh, or in most of the cases, it's smaller than the dust sublimation radius. We also saw that the disks are continuous uh, in radius. So uh, we uh, compared the size in the near infrared with Pioneer with the sizes at 10 micron with uh, MIDI in the mid infrared. And we compared that to models, very simple models of just. Um, uh, continuous disk with uh, gradient uh, power law in the temperature with radius. And in the yellow area here, we expect all the continuous disk. And you see that most of them are falling in this, uh, in this yellow area. Here you have an upper limit, there are some outliers, but, but those targets are uh, compatible with a continuous uh, disk in the first 10, 20, uh, at least astronomical uh, units. And the last conclusion that we had from the survey is that those targets are very complex. The emission morphology uh, in the near infrared is very complex. And uh, we, we saw that because we started to fit very simple models and then we increased the complexity. And we have a test to, um, to, um, to select the best model with a penalty for the number of parameters. And despite this, uh, this penalty term, most of the targets needed more than 10 parameters to just to reproduce the data because the signal in the closure phases in the visibilities was so complex that we needed very complex uh, models. So it also means that we are probably um, biased by the geometries that we put in our models. And to really investigate those, those targets, we need to do imaging and not just a snapshot survey. Uh, and this is something that we, uh, that we started with a large program that I will talk to, um, talk to about in the, in, the, in the last part of my talk. But before I'd like to talk to you about this transition disk around uh, the binaries. And so this is a very recent uh, results that we had. So transition disks are uh, were first discovered around young stars. And those are disks with a very large cavity that is several times larger than the dust sublimation radius, like five, 10, or 20 times larger. And so the cause, causes of this cavity can be uh, I mean, um, there are different uh, interpretations. Uh, one of them can be photo evaporation. So we have high energy photons from accretion on the central star that start to photo evaporate the inner parts of the disk and hence creating the cavity, which can also have disk planet uh, interaction. And you have a massive amount of planet in the disk, it will start to make uh, such, uh, uh, such cavity. So this is around the young star. And uh, around post HB binaries, we actually um, modeled one such an uh, object uh, where we find such a large cavity. So we can see here the spectral energy distribution, so the flux against the wavelengths. And you see that the infrared excess does not start in the near infrared, but starts at longer wavelengths at three, five micron. So it means that there is no dust uh, at the dust sublimation region. And uh, this target was resolved with mid infrared interferometry, and the size of uh, uh, the cavity was uh, fitted to the data. And it's about 34 astronomical units, which is like seven times larger than the dust sublimation uh, radius. And so, uh, a relative transfer model was also fitted to the data confirming this, this uh, radius. And you see that the theoretical sublimation radius is five astronomical units. So, there is another thing that is uh, making this cavity uh, very large. And we wanted to know if this disk, this transition disk is unique around post tissue binaries or if there is a population of them. So we started to look first at the SED spectral energy distribution and characterizing the infrared excess. And we see that for a 
For a full disk, if you look at the color in the near infrared, you'll have um, uh, a strong color in the near infrared for a full disk, but uh, uh, a low, um, a weak color for the transition disk. Where in the mid infrared, you'll have a strong color in the in the um, for transition disk and a flat uh, spectrum here for the full disks. And so we took all the 85 uh, positive binaries that we know of in the galaxy and we put them in this color color diagram where you have the near infrared color here and the mid infrared color here. So the full disk is here at the center of the diagram and uh, the transition disk case here is, uh, is here in the bottom uh, right part of the diagram. And so the first thing that we see from this diagram is that there is the, there is no uh, random distribution of the points, but there is some structure here. And also that AC here is not alone in this diagram. So there are other targets that are also similar to AC here, where there is a very strong mid infrared color, but almost no near infrared uh, excess. And so to be to um, to make sense of this diagram, we also model we use radiative transfer models of full disk and, and transition disk, where we uh, um, varied some uh, some parameters like the inner radius, some uh, dust grain properties, but also some density structures to make this population, this cloud of points and put them in this color color diagram. You can see that here we recover all the full disks and the transition disks are at the um, uh, bottom and right parts of this color color diagram. And so to make sense of this, we did something that is very classical when, where we first want to characterize something, we just put boxes in this color color diagram just to make sense uh, of, of, uh, of what, we, uh, what we observe. So they are quite arbitrary, but also guided by, by the radiative transfer uh, models. And then we build up an inf uh, the SCD where we normalize all the spectral energy distribution and Y micron, and we just characterize the infrared excess. So here in, in black, you have the median infrared excess of all the disks. And in the gray area, you have the 25th and 75th percentiles of the infrared excesses. So it means that half of the targets are have an infrared excess that is in the gray area. And so if you look at the at the center of the of this uh, color color diagram, you see that you have most of the disks are are here. They are full disk, and you see that the median of this category, which is called category one, are really following the the median of the full population. It's normal because this is where most of the disks are. If you look at category zero disk, you see that the infrared excess is very very strong. And actually, uh, we interpret that as just evidence for inclined disks. And so we know that most of the targets are actually uh, very uh, inclined. Then we have those category two targets when you have AC her, and we see that the infrared, there is no infrared excess for all of them, but there is a very strong infrared excess that is even stronger than the median of the, of, uh, the whole population. And so it means that you have a large cavity and that the inner rim is directly exposed to the photons from the star. That's why it's puffed up and it emits a lot in the mid infrared, most of, more than in the other types of disks. Then you have category three, when you think that there is a, a, a lack of new infrared excess, but it's not very, very clear. And you think we have a mix of full disk and transition disks. And at the end, we have category four targets where the infrared access starts very, very late. And we think that is something like a debris disk, so a disk that is uh, dissipating. And so we can see that actually the boxes that we define are very good into classifying the infrared excesses. So that's very uh, convenient. And the first conclusion that we can have is that around 10% of all the disks have a, ha, have a large cavity. So there are transition disks around a binary target. But that's not uh, all the story because we started to, to look for correlations between those categories and other observables. And we found that actually the chemical depletion of the refractory elements that I uh, talked about at the beginning of the talk here, it's tracing by iron, but we have also other elements that are showing the same trend, just iron is more easy to measure. We see that for transition disks, the depletion is stronger than for full disks. And so what does it mean? It means that for targets, when you have this large cavity, there is the dust is more easily trapped in the disk and the uh, depleted gas is accreted onto the post HB star without uh, the refractory elements. And so the most easiest way, let's say, to make uh, at, at the same time the cavity and trapping the dust is to put a giant planet in the disk that will 
perturb the disk enough to form the cavity, trap the dust, and accrete the uh, depleted gas onto the post-HB star. And what's interesting is that the same thing is seen around young star objects that have a transition disk or where there is a substructure in the disk because of planet formation. And it's uh, um, most easily seen around intermediate mass stars that have a radiative envelope where we can really probe the uh, chemical peculiarity uh, on the surface of the star and relate it to what is accreted uh, from the disk onto the central star. So that's quite uh, exciting. It's still a, a, a hypothesis. It's the most likely that we have uh, so far, and it, uh, it needs to be tested with some more observations. And so now we'll go to the second part uh, of the talk, which are observational uh, perspectives. And I will first talk about this uh, uh, VLTI large program that is called INSPIRING, that stands for Interferometric Survey of post hb Binaries with their Ring. And it's uh, 250 hours of observations with the VLTI, with Pioneer and Gravity on 11 targets. And the goal is really to have image reconstruction to not be biased by geometric models because the morphology is, is so complex. And uh, we want to recover the structure of the inner rim, see how it changes with orbital phase of the inner binary, and also see if we can detect the secondary in also other targets, um, this secondary accretion disk. And so for this, we develop a special methodology for image uh, reconstruction, where we um, uh, not only use the Bayesian uh, framework, like in classical um, image reconstruction approach in uh, infrared interferometry, but we also use neural networks to define the Bayesian prior uh, for the image reconstruction. So here, the neural networks learned from images of radiative transfer models with very, very different parameters for the orientation, the density distribution, the uh, dust grain growth, and we use this prior in the image reconstruction. So the radiative transfer models were all axis symmetric, and you see that for RSO8, you can still recover uh, the, the non-axis symmetric structures because the data is telling us that there are some non-axis symmetry, and you see that the quality of the image is um, is uh, better recovered and we can uh, see the, the asymmetries in a, in a better, better way. And so this, is, uh, this was developed by uh, uh, Rick Les, who was a, a student uh, K11 at that time. It's an organic uh, software. And so from the image, the image will inspire us the geometrical models. And we use the geometrical models to retrieve really the size, the temperatures, the orientation, of, of, uh, of all the components of the image. And then we'll use that as an input to the radiation transfer modeling to get the physical conditions in the, in the system. Of course, this large program started just before COVID. Uh, so it was a bit delayed and it's very difficult because in infrared interferometry we have just four telescopes. And so we need really to have a lot of observations to fill our, our UV plane. And if you interrupt, uh, the feeling of the UV coverage and because those are binaries, we have to start again because the binary phase already moved. And so it, it's still ongoing actually, uh, but we already had some images on some of the targets that I'm happy to show you today. So you see here that actually the morphology can be very, very complex, more complex than the geometrical models that we fitted. So for example, here we have this double ring structures. We have some more simple ones where we have the inclined uh, disk. And here, for example, we cover this primary, the secondary, but also the second binary disk, which is here. And this is a large structure that we're still not sure to understand, probably linked with an outflow that we see at very large scale with Almine this year. And we also managed to get some images of RS08 at different orbital phase so we could follow up the binary and the reaction of the disk to it. And this is just for comparison, we did a uh, similar large program on protoplanetary disk around intermediate mass stars. And this is the image uh, images that we, that we got. And you can see that even if the intermediate mass uh, young stars are closer to us because of the difference of uh, luminosity, the inner rims are not as much resolved as the post hgb binaries that are way um, uh, further from us, but are so minus that we can really resolve the, the inner rim. So that's quite, quite nice. And for IRS-08, we were able to, look, to make images at different orbital phase. We can see here that post AGB is in white. The secondary is, is redetected at each uh, period at different uh, locations. And can see that the uh, second binary disk is, 
is, um, uh, is more luminous on the side of post AGB. So this is with the classical image reconstruction. And this is with the neural networks when you really recover this uh, variation of uh, the luminosity of the, um, the brightness of the, of the disk with orbital uh, period. Okay, so this is for the very inner regions, but we also started to probe the outer regions. And this is the work of uh, Katarina Andrich who is a PhD student uh, at uh, Macquarie University who is working with sphere observation of those targets. And uh, we also see very different morphologies for, uh, from the targets that we observed. For example, here you have a very inclined disk when you see the the, um, the top surface uh, of, the, of the disk, but also the bottom surface on the other side and the center, you have the shadow because the inner the disk mid plane is very dense and we see the shadow, so that's quite cool. But we also have some more complex morphology like another rings around the disk uh, or, or does the disk alone or some more complex things. And here we have an arc and this actually is one of the transition disks, so disk with a large cavity where we really resolve the inner disk rim even with um, direct imaging uh, observation. So that's quite quite cool. So stay tuned because uh, yeah, uh, Katia will publish this uh, paper quite soon. And we also started to resolve the dust uh, of those disks with uh, ALMA. And you can see here uh, the image of uh, IRAS-08 when you see that there is uh, quite large grains uh, up to radius of 100 astronomical units. So there are really large disks, uh, uh, very uh, comparable to what we see around the young star. And they are also, um, they have a very similar mass. And here the white uh, circle is actually the dust sublimation radius as image with the VLTI with Pioneer. So you can really uh, start to have all the different scales for this disk. And so we can re really constrain the full 3D morphology of the disk from the infrared uh, with the VLTI, the mid infrared with the VLTI, the disk surface with a sphere in the infrared and the ALMA radio observations of the millimeter uh, dust. And so the goal now is trying to find a model that reproduces all the observations at once. And that's actually the uh, co most complex uh, task, but also um, the most um, interesting one. And we can really make uh, nice links between the two scale, the different scales that we are probing. So here we have an image of one such a disk where we see in CU this hourglass shaped structure. You have the bipolar outflow, you have the disk uh, in green here. And with Pioneer, we um, at very different scales. So here you see that it's a zoom of uh, 1000. Uh, we see the inner rim of the of the of the disk and the second ring that is probably above the disk mid plane and that could be the start of the outflow that we see at a very large scale. You see, it's it's also shifted towards the blue part of the of the outflow. But of course, it's still difficult to make the link because the the scales are so different. But maybe this is we really start to see uh, the basis of this outflow. And with sphere, you, you, I showed you this uh, image with this, the top surface of the disk and the bottom surface. And with the VLTI, we see that this complex structures in the inner regions is really um, erasing and we need, we need to make sense of that and, and uh, combining those data together to, to get the full, um, full disk structure. All right, so this is for the near future with um, analyzing all this data uh, together now, but for the midterm or long-term future, we want to know if uh, we can detect actually the planets that, are, that may be formed around uh, this uh, second generation disk. So we want to look for second generation uh, planets that we should find around the double binary white dwarfs. And so there are two ways to look at them. The first one is to use the ELT because we have the sensitivity to, uh, to uh, look for uh, binary wide world that are quite faint, but also angular resolution to look for these uh, companions. But also we can do that with uh, gravitational waves. And so actually Kamiya is working uh, on that. And so we expect to detect some planets about double wide dwarf. And we are uh, now working with Kamiya in order to know if we will be sensitive to a second generation of planets that are formed in disk like the post AGB binary disk. Uh, um, and if we are sensitive to this uh, population in what we will uh, detect with uh, LISA. So that's very 
very interesting, a very nice um, uh, future. Okay, so here are my conclusions. Um, so I hope that I managed to convince you that uh, post HGB, uh, the disks around post HGB binaries are very similar to disks uh, around young stars, and they are actually very interesting to. Uh, to study because we can study all the disk processes and the band formation processes in a different parameter space. And so we can really test the different uh, theories in, in these um, extreme uh, environments. And you start to see indirect signs of planets in these transi transition disks and the fact that there is a link between the structure of the disk and the chemical composition on the surface of the post AGB star. And we started a thorough observing campaign to really uh, get the full 3D structure of the circumbinary disk, and especially instruments like Matisse on the VLTI and ALMA um, are very powerful to start to study those transition disks to, to really confirm this uh, inner cavity, to measure the size of the inner cavity of the disk and see if there are some perturbations due, for, um, due uh, to, uh, to planets and confirm this uh, exciting uh, hypothesis. And I will finish uh, on those conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jax, for this wonderful talk. So now the talk is open for questions. I think uh, Camila will manage the uh, questions over there. And I will tell you if there is a question here soon. I need a microphone. Ah, OK. <laughs> Congratulations, very remarkable results. I had a concern because you say that the cavity can be created by protoplanets, a second generation in this, it could be. But I wonder, uh, you had detected uh, some transitional disk in this post AGB stage, no? But uh, in the case of protoplanetary disk, the luminosities are around uh, 10, solar luminosity 100, no more. But in case of suppose AGB star, it should, you mentioned that the luminosities goes 10 to the four, 10 to the five solar luminosities. I wonder if planets can create cavities in this case, how uh, a planets, how can survive for the high temperatures because for a system with a total luminosity is 10 to the five, you will have a very high temperatures inside these cavities. In case of the gaseous like Jupiter planets will evaporate. No? So I think the mechanism to create this cavity is no planets could be another, for example, because I had this concern with temperature. Also, I have calculated the do sublimation border for in the case of massive protostars which has similar um, luminosity. Uh, I remember, if I remember well, the size of this uh, uh, border of this radius, the sublimation radius, is about 50 AU or 100 AU, but you can um, estimate a lower value, no? I wonder how do you estimate, uh, I remember if you plot, only 10 or 10 AU for uh, the cases a central star of 10 to the 4 solar luminosity. No? Sorry for question. All right, so um, so maybe to the first uh, remark. So so the yes. the cavities are quite large actually because. Planets can survive at high temperatures if they can create this cavity. Because we are dealing with a very high luminosity in this phase, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. Yes. For the case of the planetary disk transitional disk, we have lower luminosity. And planets can survive inside this cavity. But for the case of positive stars, they are very luminous. And I think it should be other kinds of planets, no? Gaseous planets, no? Like Jupiter planets. I don't know if you understand my question. Yeah, yeah. So, so how, 
how can gaseous planets survive such a high, I mean, uh, high temperatures? And so in the so in the transition disk, the inner rim is very is way larger than the dust remission. So the temperature of the dust at the inner rim of the transition disk is several hundreds of kelvins, not it's less than thousand. Because the thousand kelvin we see, we measure the temperature of thousand kelvin at the dust sublimation radius. So I mean that a 30, 40 astronomical unit from even such a luminous star, I do not expect the temperature to be that high. Uh, actually, and, and there is, I mean, those stars are very cold, they are not warm, okay, they are, they are, they are like 4,000 Kelvin. Yeah, it's, and so here the sublimation temperature is 1,000 Kelvin. At the, at, because you have the high yeah, yeah, so 1,000 Kelvin is for the dust sublimation radius, but for the transition disk, the radius is way, is, so the temperature is, should, be, should be lower, so a few hundreds of Kelvin. I think we measured that for the... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But the ah yeah that that's for sure. But this is a full disk. This is not a transition. Disc. So, so when I what I call the transition disk. It's where the cavity is, is the cavity is way larger than the theoretical dust sublimation radius. So I agree that inside here, yeah, <laughs> it's very hot. And so the, the plants will not survive. But this is a full disk. A transition disk cavity will be five or ten times larger than that. And so here you have room to put a planet that can survive even a high luminosity of the central star. And so that the point. So, so this is the cavity that we expect for for full disk actually, and um, and so here in the near infrared, the survey that we done is is really only full disk because the full disk are bright in the near infrared, but the transition disk are not present here in this survey because they do not emit in the near infrared because there is no dust there, and so the one that we measured. Um, here, this one, the cavity, you see that the sublimation radius is expected at 5 AU, but the radius of the cavity is 34 AU, and here the temperature is... Uh, so this one, I, I have to check exactly to give, I can give you the number, but... Uh, yeah, but it depends on... Yeah, yeah, but actually, so here the, the no, no, no. For for this, it's really, uh, it's really. So we we just follow the 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 relation that we got for the full full disk. So this one, and we extrapolated this to get uh, this radius, and we measure something that is way larger than that. And so it's for this kind of disks that we think that the plant can be somewhere over here and make the cavity, but also trap the dust in the outer parts. Something that photo evaporation will not do or other processes uh, that we know of, maybe there is one, <laughs> but it's for, for the moment, this plant hypothesis is the most likely given what we know from the studies and the simulations of plant to plant disk on young stars. And now we have the observations to on this transition disk to first to confirm, to get the size of the cavity and also see if a planet can uh, reproduce the cavity and the structures that we will obtain from the observations. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that, but actually, yeah, <laughs> I would, yeah. Yeah, 
Uh, so here we have a, a small accretion disk around the secondary that we detect. And actually this is the point source, but it's very small because it has to fit um, in the row slope of the binary. So the separation is one AU so the, the disk here is about 0.5 AU. So it's a very small one. So this is the, the typical uh, separations one up to two maybe AUs from this, uh, those targets. But uh, yeah, I mean, for I mean, we just use the same relation from the distribution radius as for as for young stars and even a bit higher than that. So we, so this should scale with the square root of luminosity. So you see that, okay, we can have 10, 10 AU or radius, but uh, or some high luminosity, you have 20 AU in a radius, but we cannot reach more than that. But we can dis discuss that more in detail. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Yes. So, in these disks that you call transition disks, is that, as you mentioned, if I understood correctly, is that the inner cavity is larger than the disublimation radius. But how do you know that the rings that you see are actually stable uh, uh, Keplerian disks if you don't have uh, kinematical information? Because in some post AGB stars, what you see with the uh, line observations are expanding rings. So in that case, with time, the inner cavity will be larger naturally than the inner sublimation radius. And in your AMA observations, uh, you plan to observe a, a dust uh, emission. You plan to observe lines because the kinematics, I think, would be in, important to fully understand these disks. Okay. So yeah, you're right. To, to know if those disks are stable, we need to, to observe the Keplerian rotation, but actually we do that with uh, ALMA and plateau de Bure interferometer observations uh, at uh, a, a bit larger scale than the dust, but we see in the inner parts Keplerian rotation and in the outer very large, uh, very far from the binary, we see still expansion in some winds, but like at 1000 AU. But in the inner parts, we see Keplerian rotation. In, but I mean, not all of them, but those that could we could observe that so far. So I think there are like, uh, uh, um, we observe like 10, 10 or 15 of them. And we see in the inner parts, uh, Kepler rotation. But also we have always dust at the innermost radius where it can survive. So it means that it's not expanding, but it's staying there. There's still always dust at the dust sublimation. Uh, radius. And you also have the signs of accretion um, onto the central star with this chemical uh, depletion of the refractory uh, elements. We see uh, a jet around the secondary, so it needs to accrete. And the post AGB star has, there is no super wind anymore. It's not an AGB star, it's a post AGB star. So it's, there is not enough um, uh, mass loss from the post AGB star to, to feed the circum secondary accretion disk. And so the mass. Um, must come from the circumbinary disk. And we are now actually looking for a direct tracer of accretion, so some lines that could indicate that in the inner parts we have uh, to really constrain the accretion that we have from the disk onto the central star. And actually, so we see the, um, well, we see the jet in absorption in H alpha from the secondary, and the secondary is passing in front of the post AGB star. And so it creates the shadow in H alpha. And we modeled, so there is a student in K11 that modeled those jets. So we can uh, uh, have the, um, the velocity and the density of these jets. And he estimated the uh, amount of accretion uh, that we need to, uh, to have this amount of, uh, of outflow. And so we need uh, really accretion from the circumbinary disk to feed the circum secondary jet. So we have Keplerian rotation uh, from CO, but also signs of accretion in the inner parts of those disks. 
So, yeah. Uh, thank you for this nice talk. And I, I have a question. In, in protoplanetary disk, uh, one of the explanations that has been have been considered from the be very beginning for the presence of cavity was the presence of a binary. Because when there is a binary, the tidal interactions create a cavity. However, there is a relationship that can be modeled between the separation of the binary and the radius of the cavity. So um, did you check that, uh, because you had selected binaries, that you have that these cavities are not created by the binary itself, but for a different object that you propose as a planet? Yes, so uh, this is something that we checked with the um, with this study where we measured the circumbinary, the radius of the circumbinary uh, disk emission, and we compared it also to the uh, dynamical truncation from the inner binary. And the dynamical truncation radius is always inside, I mean, always, in 99% of the cases, it's inside the dust sublimation radius of the disk because of the high luminosity of the star. So. If not, we would have a, a larger scatter in the in the radii of the of the of the dusty uh, disks. But actually, there are few disks. I think two or three, where the sublimation radius is inside the expected dynamical radius, and so this creates a larger cavity. But this we know that it's due to the inner binary. But for the transition disk that we uh, detected apart from those um, those uh, those two targets, the others are due to something else. So we need a, a larger separation. So, but we still need to accrete the volatiles on uh, into the inner onto the post AGB star because if not, we'll have a will not have a um, will we'll not see the depletion of refractory elements and no depletion in the in the volatiles. So the companion. Um, has to be massive to trap the dust, but cannot be too massive to uh, to still let some gas through to be accreted onto the central star. So yeah, there's yeah. So the hypothesis of the third body is really that because the inner binary cannot produce such a large uh, cavity. Um, thank you so much for your nice talk. I would like to ask uh, you a question about the time scale of the planet uh, formation. I mean, do you expect uh, it to be uh, shorter or longer? And if it were longer, should be interesting in order to try to uh, test the current ideas about the planet, uh, planetary system formation? Because in that case, I guess that you could observe more in detail the different phases of the of this process of, um, I mean, the planetary formation. Yeah, so that's the, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on how you form planets, of course. If you want to form them through core accretion, it will take a long time, and we don't have enough time to do this uh, in those disks from, from the small dust grains. If you want to form through GI, so if the disk is unstable, it will be fast enough to, uh, to make them in those disks. But however, those disks are expected to be quite warm. We still need to determine, I mean, one of the key things is to, um, to probe the, um, the tumor parameters in those disks and see if they are stable, or ex expect them to be stable. But, I think if, if plant formation happens in those disks, it can be a bit um, in a different way than around young stars, because you can imagine, for example, that you already have some, some planetesimal uh, in the disk from a first generation or, or even rocky planets. And they are uh, suddenly they are in, uh, inside a second generation disk. So they will start to accrete, accrete. they will go through runaway accretion and they will become a larger uh, planet. So we can have this kind of scenarios where you already have some seeds or already have a, another giant planet that can perturb the disk, for example, and 
um, and yeah, enhance the plan formation efficiency. So these are the type of, of questions that we can, uh, we can try to, to answer or to progress on by studying what happens in, the, in, this, uh, in these disks. But uh, yeah, without going through GI, I think the, um, the core accretion alone, it'd be, it's, it's way longer than the lifetime of this. So that's why it's also interesting to probe those disks because around the stars, we start to see uh, more and more hints that information happens actually very, very quickly, much more quickly that we, that we think. Thanks. René, there are no more questions in the in the audience here. So, is there something online? There is no questions here and no questions in YouTube. So, I think we can close the talk. Thank you very much, Jax, for this wonderful talk. I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Enjoy your stay here with uh, Camila. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, René. Thank you all. Thanks.